I just wanted to say one little thing. Um, you say you thought you should read the Bible because maybe that would, that would help you to understand. Um, I, I read the Quran because I thought it would be very important for, to understand more about Islam. And uh, it, it meant that I actually located the phrase where it said that parents had to teach their kids sexuality education. Yeah. So when I have so when I have Muslim parents who say to me, you know, they're not supposed to learn that, I say, actually, <laughs> it's in the Quran. Yeah. Right. right. I'm, I'm going to encourage Thank you to create climates where we become allies, even if we mm -hmm. appear to be unlike the allies when we are seen as being separate people. Um, and there's sort of four areas where I think this is really to me very clear. And the first piece is around talking about human rights and how our human rights around sexual orientation and our human rights around faith and religion come from the same document. And we can't pick and choose from that document. We get the whole package. When we talk about family diversity in the grade three curriculum and in other places, we're talking about all forms of family diversity. So we're talking about lesbian and gay parents, we're talking about intergenerational families living together, we're talking about caregivers, we're talking about um, multiple cousins and families living within the same family home. So then you can start saying, respecting these diverse families is the same business as respecting these diverse families, and we have some common pieces. And I've also had success talking with students about um, who might want not to share all of their identity, and doing activities that talk about how, how much energy does it consume and how are you not able to learn if you can't bring your whole self into the classroom. And we often think about lesbian and gay students being closeted or about queer spawn being closeted. But we need to also recognize that people may be closeted about their immigration status. They may be closeted about their faith. There's a whole number of identity markers that we might choose not to share, that we might be fearful of sharing. And when we talk about creating inclusive and safe classrooms, we need to think about all of these at the same time. And when we can start listing our commonalities, it makes it a little bit harder to make them separate categories and argue about. Thank you. Um, if I can also, you know, the argue, the, the notion that we, we choose our sexual orientation or our gender identity, yes. but then arguably we also choose our religion as well. Um, and so if people want uh, accommodation or respect because they're Muslim or because they're Christian or whatever they might happen to be, and they, they are that out of choice as well. So then should they be denied because it's their choice? And one of the arguments that I've tried to use with varying degrees of success depending on who you're talking to is as Muslims we make up 2% of the population in a country which is majority Christian. We deny the divinity of Christ. That must be offensive to some Christians, I'm sure. Um, but we're accommodated because we have religious freedoms and we have other freedoms as well. So um, if people think that other people are choosing their orientation or their gender identities, then they too might also be choosing their religion, but they still expect certain respect and, and accommodation for that. So. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Ken. Good to see you. That's hey, good to see you too. I just, <laughs> Ken, just quickly, I wanted to say that Often intellectual arguments don't work very well if people are homophobic. Right. And, and often we think, oh, if we could just offer the right rational argument, it'll be, it'll be simple. It's not. These, these things are very visceral. And they're complicated. And, and I, I, I wish I knew how to answer some of those questions, but this is why we need to get to a sex education early. Because in my mind, kids are not racist when they're young. They're not. And they're not homophobic when they're, not, when they're young. If we can build that in so that it's part of their physical, sociological, psychological, intellectual framework, when they grow up, they will be good people. And we won't have to worry about trying to find intellectual arguments to, to reason with them. So my view is, let's work on this as fast as we can. I have a feeling that many of our panelists are going to want to answer the same question, so I'm going to try something a little bit different. I'm going to ask each of the folks at the microphone to ask their question. I see everyone's got a piece of paper and a pen up here. If you could just write down what you want to respond to, and then we'll, we'll sort of take it up as a group. So we'll go to microphone one. Uh, I'm not sure that I understood that instruction. You, do, you just, all you have to do is ask your I'll question. Ask you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Bear Bergman. Um, I was one of the original seven founders of the first ever GSA, um, which I mention only, 
which I mention only because I want it to be clear how long I have been having this conversation. Um, and to the students, I have to say, you know, as we would say in Yiddish, I have felt this on my own skin, right? I've been where you are, and I know what's great and what sucks about what's happening. And all I can say is, um, in 20 years, people will be applauding for you, hey? More than they are today. Um, to the panelists, I want to ask the question that I would have wanted to ask when I was 16, which is, what should I do right now? If I am a uh, Catholic high school student or a public board high school, if I'm a high school student and I want to work in solidarity with these young people at St. Joe's and with other uh, queer and trans and allied young people who are interested in starting their own Catholic school GSAs. What do I do in each of your sort of fields of expertise right now? Who do I call? What do I write? Where do I show up? What do I say? How do I start right now to do something to create some momentum? Okay, now we're gonna go to microphone two. So the panelists are gonna take each of the questions and then we're gonna respond as a group to all three. My name is Charles Gibbs. I am a teacher at the TDSP for my first year. I was in Quebec for quite a while. I lived in Quebec, although I'm originally from here. And I have an experience there which I thought would be pertinent and useful. They have a group there. I was a volunteer. And it's called Le Cri, which is a research group and a intervention group. And they go into schools, into high schools primarily, into colleges as well. Uh, one uh, gay man and one lesbian or, or other combinations. And uh, they just answer questions. Uh, they're there just to answer questions, they briefly introduce themselves, talk about their coming out, and, and then just respond to the questions. The advantage of that is it's not the teacher who's there all the time, who's going to see the kids the next day again, who, has, who, who brings up these issues. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's, no, there's no worry, there's no shame. Uh, they're actually, they say, you know, we're, we won't be here tomorrow, don't worry, you know, go for it. So uh, maybe I feel the energy here tonight that, for that kind of uh, possibility. I think it was quite effective there, and it's just exploding now. It's completely exploding. They do, I think they did, they've done a thousand interventions this year. Oh, thank you. If we go to microphone one. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Dingwall. I want to commend these young, young men and women up here on the stage for your courage. I wish I had your courage when I was 16, when I was in high school. I didn't. I graduated from high school in 1976, and I, I wasn't able to come out until I was 34 years old. But you kids are fantastic. Please pass on to your, to your mates at school, in your GSAs, that they are not alone. If they aren't getting support, tell them to start screaming, but so that adults will hear them, will hear all of you, and stand up and put an end to this bigotry that is crucifying and killing us. And I have a question to everyone else here in the room tonight. Why isn't Corporate Canada standing up for these young people and for or the rest and the rest of the community? I challenge everyone in the room to go to Corporate Canada and say, where are you? Why aren't you there to stop these kids from being harmed? You 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 take their money. You advertise to them, you pander to them, you try to get their influence. Where are you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to start by again commending uh, the youth to come out here. Um, but as uh, also with the panelists, a lot of you brought up the issue, sorry I'm a little nervous. Um, is that uh, this isn't an issue just about one Catholic school or two Catholic schools. And I do want to commend you guys to be able to be out and be open like that. Um, but there is a lot of youth out there that are not able to do that, especially in rural Ontario. And I feel as adults, we're finally in a place that I'm glad we're at a forum that we're able to talk about these things. But this is clearly an issue about public funding. Um, my money is paying for homophobia. And my money is paying for the lack of sexual education. And so, um, yes, I'm happy that there is um, support here from the NDP, but there isn't a lot of support here. 
Um, and so as, as, as advocates and leaders um, that I know I look up to, um, whether it's Queer Ontario, whether it's Al Farouk, thank you for your comments around um, public systems being funded um, for religion. Um, we all work in the same world every day. And if homophobia is taught to these students, they're still working in my public domains and they're still working in our Canada. And so homophobia is being passed on to our generations for the future. So I have a question to Queer Ontario and all the panelists is, what are us as agencies that are leaders in this change doing on a larger level in Ontario and even Canada to make sure that this isn't just happening on an individual GSA level, but hopefully on a more public system level? Thank you. Thank you, microphone one. Hello there, Brad Thomas, York Region District School Board. Thank you very much for an excellent forum. Glad we came down from the north with a couple of colleagues. My question goes out to the entire room. We had a conference called Speak Out in November. And at the conference, it was very well run. The director uh, of our board came and, and spoke and uh, was very clear about his direction with the board about basically going beyond safe. And um, I think it really inspired. I think, Jay, you were actually, I believe you were there. I'm not, I not sure. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Um, I thought I, I'm not sure where I met you before. But um, my question basically is to gauge support from the union because af afterwards we had a, uh, for all the GSA facilitators along with administrators, we were in, in a very direct way told not to come out, not to share personal uh, issues with students and I took issue with that because I said isn't that inequitable because as a teacher especially what I would like to be as a role model for the GSA at my school I feel it's important to be able to come out. The union, I'm not sure why this directive was came from our district which is district 16 I'm not sure whether other districts are also experiencing the same um, uh, council to avoid sharing personal, and this is for straight and, and gay. My, my point was, you know, a, a, a teacher may get married, a female, she changes her name, obviously she's been, she got married. I get married, I don't change my name, but I want to share it with some of my students, about my partner, whatever, and I'm basically being told not to. I just want to find out if other people have experienced the same negativity because as you know being part of a union I would like to be feel supported by it but it was very clear that basically in maybe five years we'll be ready to come out but, but in five years I'll be retired so I mean I, I'm not I'm at the point now I'm frustrated because this is a directive from the union and has anybody else felt the same uh, direction not to come out can we ask can we have Totally. Uh, I, I, I've, I've brought this up. I, it'll, be, it'll be, I guess, my swan song issue, I hope, uh, to deal with because I've, I feel in my 28 years of, of being an educator, I've certainly come a long way. I've been at former uh, conferences at the same school coming down from York Region. York Region has come a long way from, from a position where we were basically told, you know, very directly not to talk about issues of sexual orientation nor about abortion. We had to put, I, I was part of a meeting where we wrote a document called the Sensitive Issues Document. So we've come up, you know, leaps and bounds. And I commend the students uh, for what you're doing also because, I mean, you're part of the, the grassroots. And being part of the grassroots is difficult. Being a pioneer is very difficult. So congratulations to you. And I'll, I'll look forward to talking to anybody afterwards to see if they've experienced the same negativity from the union. Thank you. Mike.